Inshallah, we continue with the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah from verse number 235. Today, Inshallah, we hope to cover the three verses up to 237, Inshallah. As you know, these um, verses that we've been covering so far, the previous few verses, were dealing with the rules regarding the waiting period, the idda of the wife after her husband passes away. And the verses before that were dealing with the waiting period of the woman after divorce and the rules surrounding the various situa situations that can arise. So the theme of the rules surrounding the idda period of women who find themselves in different situations due to the means of separation, either through death of husband or divorce, continues in the next few verses. These rules and guidance, why are they so important? Why are they so critical? Mainly because to protect the rights and to protect the haq, the hukuk of the different parties, the rights of the different parties, and to make clear what is the Islamic ruling regarding each situation. Because this is a time and a place where when people separate either due to the husband passing away or through a divorce, parties can be vulnerable. They can be very weak, they can be vulnerable. People's rights can be taken away. People's rights are not looked after. So in these situations, the Quran makes clear what are the rights of each party, what are the rules surrounding those situations. That's why it's important for us to understand what the Qur'anic guidance on this is, so that we are following the Qur'anic guidance in all areas of our lives and that we may educate others in the community. And of course, these situations are, uh, are occurring more and more because the population is growing, our communities are growing, um, and, and we find ourselves in faced with many more cases of separation, whichever way, through different means. And it's very important that we understand the rules surrounding those so that nobody's rights are trampled upon. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah verse 235, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي مَا عَرَّدْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ خِطْبَةِ النِّسَاءِ مِنْ خِطْبَةِ النِّسَاءِ أَوْ أَكْنَنْتُمْ فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ and there is no sin in the hints of proposal that you may send to the widowed women or conceal in your hearts. عَلِمَ اللَّهُ أَنَّكُمْ سَتَذْكُرُونَهُنَّ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُوَاعِدُوهُنَّ سِرًّا إِلَّا أَن تَقُولُوا قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Allah knows that you will remember them. Yet do not make firm promises of marriage except if you say something honorable. وَلَا تَعْزِمُوا أُقْدَةَ النِّكَاحِ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ الْكِتَابُ أَجَلَةِ But do not resolve upon the marriage site until the prescribed term of waiting has been completed. اللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ فَحْذَرُوهُ وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ فَحْذَرُوهُ And be aware that Allah knows what is in your hearts, therefore be aware of Him. وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ حَلِيمٌ And know that Allah is all-forgiving, all-forbearing. <clears throat> so this verse, 235, mainly deals with the issue of mentioning or proposing for marriage whilst the widow or somebody who's divorced uh, completely, but mainly has come for the widow in this context, but it applies to the one who's also... Uh, had a irrevocable divorce, it mentions the issue of proposing to such a woman in her waiting period, the idda. The idda is what the waiting period after the widow has, uh, after the husband has passed away, the wife has to wait four months and ten days as the waiting period, in which there are various rules which we covered last week. One of them is that she can't get married in that period, right? Or if somebody has, uh, is, has been divorced irrevocably, 
then she has to wait three menstrual cycles. In both these situations, this verse deals with me mentioning marriage. Can a man propose? Of course, they can't marry that woman while she's in the idda period, in the waiting period. But can the man propose to her? Can they agree something? Can they uh, have a proposal of marriage? This is what the verse is dealing with. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when we may, someone may ask why is, you know, this verse is a peculiar topic. But in the time of the Pro Prophet Sallallahu when women used to be widowed, like husband passed away, or when women were divorced, many men would rush or they would vie with each other to propose to that woman. So they don't miss the opportunity or they're not last in the queue, so they're in the front line, you know, in terms of getting married. Population was smaller without a doubt, <clears throat> smaller communities, smaller towns, and, and you know, um, the, the number of women around, the number of men, etc., would be a small number. So if good women were available, there'd be competition to marry them. Also, it was the culture, there was nothing taboo about a widowed woman. There was nothing taboo, there was nothing negative about a widow, or nothing ne negative about a divorced woman. Hence, the Prophet ﷺ himself, uh, our mother Khadija radiallahu anha, she was also a um, widowed. She was a widow who the Prophet ﷺ married or divorced. Was it divorced or widowed? I don't remember. Widowed, I think. Um, so the Prophet ﷺ also married, and this was. Um, very, very common. This was common. It was normal. There was nothing wrong with it. Hence, because this used to happen, that widows who are wait in their waiting period, men would come and propose to them, or men would want to propose to them. Hence the verse. So, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا جُنَا عَلَيْكُمْ فِي مَا عَرَّدْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ خِطْبَةِ النِّسَاءِ أَوْ أَكْنَنْتُمْ فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ And there is no sin in the hints of proposal that you may send to the woman, i.e. the widowed woman in this context, or conceal in your heart. So if you give a hint of a proposal, not a clear proposal, there is nothing wrong, there's no sin whilst the woman is in her waiting period, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عَلِمَ اللَّهُ أَنَّكُمْ سَتَذْكُرُونَهُنَّ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُوَاعِدُوهُنَّ لَا تُوَاعِدُوهُنَّ سِرًّا إِلَّا أَن تَقُولُوا قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Allah knows that you will remember them, meaning Allah knows you will be thinking about them. Once a woman's available, especially in their context, maybe not so much today, but in their context at that time, if a woman became available for marriage because the husband's passed away or for other reasons, Allah says He knows that you will be thinking about them, meaning marrying them. But then Allah says, but do not make firm promises of marriage. وَلَكِنْ لَا تُوَاعِدُوهُنَّ سِرًّا except if you say something honorable. إِلَّا أَن تَقُولُ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Meaning Allah knows in most cases you wouldn't be able to hold back. You'll be thinking about them and you'll be uh, waiting to express your desire to marry her. Allah knows this, right? Allah knows this. So He says, He knows this, He makes you aware that He knows you want to offer them in marriage, you want to offer, uh, you want to make yourself available and ask them for marriage. Hence Allah makes clear, do not make firm promises of marriage. What does it mean? لا توعدوهن سرا Literally, do not promise them سرا Sir is something which is secret or hidden. Right? So some people said the original words of the original word of sir here in Arabic it originally meant the physical relations, sexual relations, meaning do not commit any sexual relations whilst 
in the waiting period with the widow. That some people said this is the meaning, but the majority say the meaning is um, do not make a promise of marriage contract. Meaning when the woman is in her waiting period, the four months and ten days or the three menstrual cycles, do not make a clear promise of contract with them in secret. This is what it means. Do not make a promise of marriage in secret during the waiting period. Like, don't say, not just clear marriage, don't, not just I, I want to marry you, that you can't say while you're in the waiting period. Even things like, I'm in love with you, you can't say that to the woman who's in the waiting period. Or things like, promise me you will not marry someone else after the Iddah finishes. You can't say that to the woman who's in her waiting period because these are seen as direct offers or proposals for marriage. However, um, you can say, there's other forms which you can say, things like, if you, if you say indirectly, if you say things like, don't worry, after your waiting period you'll be taken care of, this is indirect. Or um, you can even say, <clears throat> I, you can even talk about yourself and say, I'm looking for a suitable uh, spouse or wife for myself. And you can praise her qualities, but not mentioning that you want to marry her. Um, or you can say to the guardian, for example, do not forget to talk to me when you receive a proposal for her. So you can let the guardian know that after the waiting period, speak to me first before you receive any other proposal. So indirectly, these are fine. You can do that. Um, so all of the, most of the Salaf, most of the Imams, most of the companions and, and the followers, they all said that one is allowed to mention marriage indirectly to the woman whose husband died. It is also allowed to indirectly mention marriage to a woman who had gone through final irrevocable divorce. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi an example is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi ordered Fatima bint Qais to remain in the house of Ibn, uh, Ibn Umm Maktoum for Idda when her husband Abu Amr ibn, ha ibn Hafs divorced her for the third time. He said to her, فَإِذَا حَلَلْتِ فَآذِنِينِ Inform me when your Idda term earn, uh, ends. So when she finished the waiting period, Usama bin Zayd, the Prophet Sallallahu freed slave, asked to marry her and the Prophet Sallallahu married her to him. So this is an example where the Prophet Sassam, while she was in her waiting period, she, he simply said, consult with me or you know, inform me when your waiting period finishes. Which means he has something for her with respect to marriage. marriage and Usama bin Zaid came and Prophet Sassam got them to married. So the, the clear rule, the simple rule here is, during the waiting period, Somebody is in their waiting period, a woman in a waiting period, do not approach them for marriage. Except if it is indirect. But be careful because always remember different cultures have different norms and different rules. Sometimes, you know, if both parties are not aware of these rules of the Quran, and if the culture is very different, this may backfire. Even you hinting may backfire. So it, it, it can change culture to culture in terms of how and what you say. But the clear rule is you cannot offer or propose in marriage a woman who is in her waiting period. You can only hint or give uh, indirect hints or speak to the guardian and, and say let me know when she is ready to marry, etc. In our times you may think um, we don't hear much about these cases, but these things do happen in our times as well. There are problems uh, where these things happen. So it's important for us to educate our communities. These issues, these cases sometimes come up. Not only that, in the waiting period, people offer, propose and get married, or they at least propose and agree directly 
and then as soon as waiting period is over, they get married. Those cases also are around in our community. But worse than that, worse than that is also some cases come in our to our attention that whilst forget the waiting period, while they're married, someone will propose and agree and then get the divorce and marry that other person. That of course is completely haram. To propose or to even hint to propose or to even hint at to a married woman, this is completely haram. There's no room for even discussion there. It's completely haram. It's a major, major sin. It's a major, major sin. But some people would do it in the waiting period, a direct proposal. That is also a major sin. It's not allowed. It's not it's completely haram to do that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَعْزِمُوا أُقْدَةَ النِّكَاحِ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ الْكِتَابُ أَجَلَ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ فَاحْذَرُوهُ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ حَلِيمٌ But do not resolve upon the marriage tie until the prescribed term has been completed. And be aware that Allah knows what is in your hearts, therefore be aware of Him and know that Allah is all forgiving, all forbearing. So the scholars agree that the marriage contracts during the idda are invalid. If, even if somebody agreed, first his direct proposal is not allowed. Secondly, of course, if a proposal is not allowed, you're not allowed to actually conduct the nikah. You're not allowed to actually complete a marriage contract in the waiting period. All of the scholars agree this is invalid. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that he knows what is in your minds, so fear him. If you can't wait, if you can't hold yourself back, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you're thinking. He knows what is in your hearts. So fear him, be aware that he watches, he sees, he hears everything. That you'll be held accountable. So with that in mind, do not propose, do not enter into any marriage contract with a woman who's in her waiting period. <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages people to be aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beware of him, have fear of him and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages them by saying وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ حَلِيمٌ Even if you have these desires or these intentions if you can control them, if you can hold back if you can follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then he is غفور he is oft forgiving, he always forgives, he is continuously forgiving and he is halim, most forbearing. You know, he'll overlook, he'll, um, patience is not the word to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he is forbearing. You know, he can take many, you know, his slaves commit sins all the time. He's patient in that sense with, with his slaves. He's not going to run out of patience. He'll still forgive if you do tawbah. No matter how often you sin, no matter how often you make mistakes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready, willing. He's not going to give up on you. He's not going to get angry that you haven't made tawbah yet. No, the door is always open for tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there to forgive. This door of forgiveness is always open. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs the people who may be struggling in that situation to hold back and to follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to expect his forgiveness if they do that. Then in verse number 236 and 237, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be discussing or talking about two other situations when it comes to um, divorce, two other situations. The first situation is about what happens when a divorce occurs before the marriage has been consummated? Marriage has before the marriage, which means a divorce happens and the husband and wife have no physical relations yet. So the contract of nikah happens, the marriage contract is done, everything's agreed, but before the husband and wife have any relation, there's no sexual intercourse, before they have any relation of that sort, the physical relation, um, divorce takes place. This is one situation, one scenario. 
In that scenario, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا جناح عليكم إن طلقتم النساء ما لم تمسوهن أو تفرضوا لهن فريضة. That there is no blame upon you if you divorce women you have not touched nor specified for them an obligation. So the situation is that divorce has taken place before the husband and wife have had sexual intercourse and the husband or both parties have not agreed the mahar. So two things here. No relation has taken place. Marriage has not been com consummated. Secondly, the mahar has not been agreed. It's not been specified. So in this situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there's no sin, there's no blame upon you if you divorce women. You have not touched nor specified for them an obligation. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَتِّعُوهُنَّ عَلَى الْمُوسِعِ قَدَرُهُ وَعَلَى الْمُقْتِرِ قَدَرُهُ مَتَاعًا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ That uh, the wealthy, but give them a gift of compensation. The wealthy according to his cap capability and the poor according to his capability. حَقًّا عَلَى الْمُحْسِنِينَ A duty upon the doers of good. A provision according to what is acceptable, a duty upon the doers of good. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed this divorce to take place, this type of divorce to take place, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply commands the husband in those situations to give the wife a gift of a reasonable amount. The rich according to his means, and the poor according to his means. The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not specify the amount of gift to be paid in this situation. Remember this, this is a very specific situation. The situation is that the marriage contract has taken place. There's been no intercourse, there's no, been no consummation of the marriage. And the mahar has not been agreed. In that situation, what should happen? They can separate if the divorce takes place. And simply the husband should pay a gift according to his means. Whatever he can afford, pay a gift to, his, uh, to the divorcee. A situation like this occurred, Bukhari reports in his Sahih, that Sahal bin Sa'ad and Abu Usaid said that the Prophet Sallallahu married somebody called Umayma bint Sharahid. When she was brought to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he extended his hand to her. But she did not like that. The Prophet ﷺ then ordered Abu Usaid to provide provisions for her along with the gift of two garments, meaning the Prophet ﷺ sent her back. A marriage took place between the Prophet ﷺ and this uh, lady, Umayma. But for some reason, when the uh, contract was done, when she was taken to the room of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ extended his hand to her um, but she did not like that. She did not like it or she showed some signs of reservation or something, whatever it was. The Prophet then sent her back. So the contract took place and there was no physical relation. The marriage was not consummated. So he sent her back along with a gift of two garments, two pieces of clothing, two garments for her. This is what happened. There's an explanation why some, some people said she wasn't um, me mentally, she wasn't well or something like that. There was other issue with her and, you know, she, or she wasn't um, mature and things like that in her intellectual cap uh, capacity. Some people say, uh, have explained that in that case. But the main point is that when that happens in that situation, the mahar hasn't been agreed. You just simply give a gift according to your capability. Then verse 237, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, describes another situation, similar situation, but this time the mahar has been agreed. The mahar has been agreed. So it's the same as the last case, the contract happened. There was no consummation of the marriage, no physical relation between the husband and wife. And, but the mahar itself, the amount to be paid by the husband, 
has been agreed. So what happens here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن طَلَّقْتُمُوهُنَّ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَن تَمَسُوهُنَّ وَقَدْ فَرَدْتُمْ لَهُنَّ فَرِيضَةً فَنِسْفُ مَا فَرَدْتُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ يَعْفُونَ أَوْ يَعْفُوَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ أُقْدَةُ النِّكَاحِ وَأَنْ تَعْفُوا أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَى And if you divorce them before you have touched them, and you have already specified for them an obligation, meaning the mahar, then give half of what you have specified, meaning give half of the mahar. Unless they forego the right or the one in whose hand is the marriage contract foregoes it. And to forego it is nearer to righteousness. And do not forget graciousness between you. Indeed, Allah is aware of whatever you do. He is seeing, He is aware, He sees whatever you do. So in this situation, the husband has to pay half the mahar. Whatever was agreed in terms of the mahar, he pays half of it. Right? But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after he says this is what the rule is, he says, uh, The husband should pay half the mahar, except... Except or unless they forego the right or the one in whose hand the marriage contract forgoes it. What does this mean? Most scholars said it means unless the husband uh, means you know, the one whose hand the marriage contract is, is referring to the husband. But some of the scholars said, yes, that is true, it's referring to the husband. But before that, um, unless they forgive, this bit is referring to the woman. So pay half the mahar, unless she gives that half back, or unless the husband wants to pay the full. This is the meaning. Right? So either way, the rule is, bottom line is, the wajib, the obligation is, the husband pays half the mahar. But if the wife wants to, if the wife wants, the woman wants to pay it back and forgive him, she doesn't want it, she doesn't need it, that's fine. Or if the husband wants to pay the full, right? He can do that as well. If he wants to pay more, or if he just wants to pay that half, he can do that as well. Either way, it's fine. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something very important here. He says, وَأَن تَعْفُوا أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَى وَأَن تَعْفُوا أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَى And to forgive or to forego, that is nearer to taqwa that is nearer to piety and righteousness. Meaning the one who forgives, that person is closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person has more taqwa. That person is nearer to taqwa, to righteousness. The one who forgives. Um, Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say this? Why did he say this is nearer to taqwa? Because one of the um, one of the characteristics of the people of taqwa, it may be misunderstood that the people of taqwa are those who always follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from the haram. They're very strict, they're very um, they hold on to the laws and the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people of taqwa. The taqwa is to implement the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to stay away from the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sometimes when people are on this path, they can become a little bit um, hard-hearted. Right? If you're always saying, you know, this is haram, this is halal, this is wajib, this is we have to do, 
This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what is expected. However, in doing so, people can become a little bit hard-hearted. They can become a little bit harsh. Right? They may think that paying this half, that's, that's the obligation. Allah said it in the Quran. Pay this half. Why should I pay more? You know, that's the rule. So he said it's, it's closer to taqwa if you have a soft heart and you forgive. If you ov overlook to the woman, same thing. You know, if you give that back, because really the marriage didn't, you know, nothing happened in the marriage. Contract happened, hardly lived together. He didn't spend anything on her, she didn't spend anything on him. He didn't do anything, she didn't do any uh, service for the family or she didn't lose out in that sense. So if you want, give that half back. That is be closer to taqwa, that is better. Same with the man. He gets a discount of half. That's the rule. But if he wants out of his generosity, out of his, uh, to forego that, that half, give the full, that's also encouraged. That's closer to taqwa. So both are encouraged um, to do this because to have a soft heart that is forgiving, full of mercy, this is what taqwa should develop. Yes, the rules and regulations have to be abided by. But the rules and regulations have to be abided with rahma, with mercy, with forgiveness, with generosity, with nobility. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging here. That's number one. To emphasize this more, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَنْسَأُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ وَلَا تَنْسَأُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so first you have the rule which is half mahar, give the half mahar. The man has to give, obligation. The woman can take, but the woman has the right to take it. So then Allah says that, you know, if you forgive, either the wife or the husband forgives, either way, this is closer to taqwa. Then, to emphasize and build on this important aspect of forgiving and overlooking and being generous in our dealings, Allah then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَلَا تَنْسَأُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ And do not forget graciousness between yourselves. Do not forget generosity between yourselves. Do people forget what generosity is? No. Do people forget what nobility is? Do people forget what mercy is? You'll never forget. If you know, if you've heard what mercy is once, you'll... You know, you don't forget. But why did Allah say, subhanahu wa ta'ala say, وَلَا تَنْسَأُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ Do not forget. It's like in English, we say, don't forget uh, to visit me, or don't forget to do this or that. We know it's not that you completely forget. Or when somebody, somebody says after seeing them a long time, or a friend or relative who doesn't keep in touch with you, a friend or relative, you see them after a long time, but they never keep in touch with you. You say to them what? You've forgotten me, right? Have they really forgotten you? No, they just haven't been in contact with you. They haven't bothered to keep in contact with you. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means here is not that you're going to forget to be generous, but you're going to hardly be generous, meaning don't forget to be generous between each other because people hardly are. People hardly, because people usually, so when it comes to mu'amalat, dealing with each other, generally, when it comes to mu'amalat, they forget or they, they're very, um, they're generous in very few occasions. They're hardly generous. When it comes to money, especially wealth, money, people are hardly ever generous. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calls this forgetting because it's so less, it's almost not there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging us to be generous. Another example of this is, um, it's reported that Jubair bin Mut'im once visited Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. Sa'ad proposed that he marry his daughter. He agreed and the marriage took place then and there. But when he ba went back, he divorced her and sent the mahar in full. 
So remember, this is the case we were talking about. How much does he have to pay? Mahar? Half. But here, he paid in full. Same case, same situation, he paid in full. Then he was asked, why did you marry her in the first place? You know, you went back and you just divorced straight away. And on top of that, you paid the full mahr. So he was asked, why did you marry her in the first place? He said, because uh, he proposed, meaning Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas proposed, and I didn't like to say no. He was asked, okay, fine, but then why did you pay the full mahar? Why did you pay the mahar in full? He said, what about fadl? What about this? وَلَا تَنْسَوا الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ So he, here is an example in practice where somebody, he didn't have to pay the full. He recalled this ayah who says, this is, I'm practicing this ayah. I'm practicing, if anyone's in this situation, don't, don't follow the first bit. Don't get married just because somebody requested you and then you divorced them. In our uh, communities or culture, this wouldn't go down too well. But if you're in the situation of the second bit, to forgive or to give more than their rights, give. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see from us. This is very important because people, when they interact with each other, when they interact with each other, they often... Um, what they do is, there's three ways that they interact. There's three ways that people often interact with each other. When it comes to other people's rights. Either we neglect their rights, so other people, they have rights given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It may be in a business deal, it may be in a marriage, it may be due to relations, parents, children, it may be due to many, many positions, different situations. There's always um, cases or situations where the other person has some rights over you. It may be a manager-employee relation, it may be anything. In these situations, most people act in one of three ways. Number one, they neglect the other people's rights, right, while demanding their own fully. So this is zulm, this is oppression, this is haram, this is wrong. People neglecting other people's rights. Those rights are given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot change them. We cannot neglect them. We'll be held accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, we give the other person's rights, which is wajib. We fulfill their rights, but only up to the level that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made obligatory. We don't give them anything more. We just fulfill their rights up to the minimum level. Thirdly, um, we, don't, we, we give more than what the other person is due. We give more than what the other person is due. Or we take less than what we are due. We take less than what we are due. These are the uh, three levels, if you like, in terms of how people deal with each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants us to deal with other people in the highest way. Not just looking at what's the minimum standard, what's the minimum I have to pay. No, He encourages us. It's better for us. It's much better for us that we either forgive people, so I may be owed money by somebody, or I may be owed X, Y, and Z by somebody. <clears throat> it's better. I can take that. It's my right. I have a right to that money, I have a right to that service, I have a right to whatever we agreed, contract. I have a right. But if the other person cannot pay or some situation has arisen, Islam encourages us to forgive the other person as much as possible. No one's saying you should become bankrupt, but as much as possible. Islam encourages us not to take our full rights. Secondly, if everybody took their rights fully, how would the community be? If nobody forgives anybody, how would the community... Life would be very difficult. Life would be very difficult. Thirdly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how does He deal with us? How does He deal with us? He deals with us on the level three. 
obviously we can't compare with our dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but he always gives us more than we have the right to in fact we have no rights when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have no rights Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't reward us according to our action only do you think that you know if somebody works for you for one month and you pay them two thousand pounds three thousand pounds five thousand whatever the salary is that is work and in exchange that is a payment if you live for 30 years 40 years 50 years and you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you obey him you're in his ubudiyya you do your prayers you do your fasting you pay your zakat you stay away from the haram but in there you make mistakes as well you commit sin sometimes you miss something your salah or something sometimes you do haram what is the reward of that 40 50 years if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you and he enters you into paradise Paradise is not only the quality of things you will have there, but the length of time, it's eternal. So, how can it be that 40, 50 years you work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He gives you paradise which none of the enjoyment and delights that's in paradise, no uh, eye has ever seen no ear has ever heard or no mind has ever thought of. And that's forever and ever. Do you think that's a reward? Do you think that is an equal reward for what you've put in? No way. It's pure fadl. It's pure favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا تَنْسَأُوا الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ This is pure fadl, pure favor and mercy. It's a pure gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's nothing, nothing to do with I deserve this because of what I've done. It doesn't even matter. There's no comparison. The amount of times I've disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The amount of times I've done salah where my mind is not even in the prayer. The amount of times I've committed haram. My weakness, my poor quality of ibadah. Do you really think that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to pay us exactly what it's worth, that he would give us Jannah? No way. No way. Jannah, paradise, reward and forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a complete and utter absolute favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's nothing, the Prophet said, none of you shall enter paradise based on your deeds and they said not even you ya rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said not even me unless allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers me completely in his mercy so this is how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats us we get rewards yes the command is there we have to obey allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have to do our salah and fasting and all of that yes Without that, you have no chance. But always remember the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on us. Remember that He's always forgiving. Not only that, He's always giving us much more, much more than we deserve. Much, much more. We can't count it infinitely more than we deserve. If that is the situation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we want that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would like us like to see that in you and me when we deal with other people. The Prophet said the slave, Allah is in the assistance of his slave as, as long as he, the slave is in assistance of his brother. Meaning as long as you are helping others, Allah will be help, helping you. As long as you are forgiving others, Allah will be forgiving you. As long as you show generosity, nobility and favors and graciousness to other people, is with respect to your rights and their rights, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely, definitely show favors to you and forgive you and overlook your faults. If you develop this softness in your heart, if you de develop this forgiving nature and attitude, 
in the meaning of the hadith that the Prophet said, do you know which um, person the fire is forbidden for? He said, every heart which is soft, the person who has a soft heart, right? he forgives people very easily. He overlooks his own rights. He gives more than he's demanded. He gives more than the other person is owed. This is the person whose the fire is forbidden. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes to see this, see this quality in us. This is why he encourages us to do this. And in terms of, and he's encouraging it in such a situation, which is probably one of the most difficult situations where it's needed the most. Where it's needed the most when it comes to relationships, when it comes to divorce between husband and wife. As we know in the community, cases and cases where it ends up very, very, um, very badly for both sides, or at least one side. Very acrimonious, very hateful, very revengeful, um, you know, people trying to take other people's wealth without right, you know, getting their own back in, with spite and hatred for each other. Because they want, not, not only do they want their rights, they want more. They want as much as possible from the other side. But in that situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that be generous, overlook, forgive. It's easier said than done. Be generous, overlook and forgive. This is the same as uh, when Abu Bakr radiallahu an, when, uh, when, when Aisha radiallahu anha, Obviously, his daughter was accused falsely, and uh, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala cleared her name. And one of those who was spreading the the false accusation is somebody that Abu Bakr radiallahu an. He used to pay for his maintenance. He used to uh, maintain him. Basically, he was a poor person. He used to maintain him. He used to pay his food and uh, accommodation and things like that. And Abu Bakr radiallahu he said. I'm going to stop this now. This is his daughter, it's understandable. You accused his daughter who's innocent, who's, who's the best uh, believer amongst the, the women, who's so chaste and innocent and pious. And as a father, he was hurt. And he said he's going to stop the payment after that. But what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He said, you know, he said in the Quran, in the meaning that would, wouldn't you like to be forgiven? Like, don't cut off uh, this maintenance or this support because wouldn't you like to be forgiven as well? Meaning, forgive him. He's done that, forgive him. So always forgiveness comes with a huge, huge reward. It's because we think short term, that's all it is. We don't have the iman, we don't have the yaqeen. We think short term, we think we're going to lose something. We think we're going to gain something. We think if I let go, if I forgive, I'm going to lose something. And if I take more than my share, I'm going to gain something. No. It's always, always a loss. In the long term, you only gain when you give extra, when you forgive, when you're generous, when you're noble, when you're gracious. This is when you gain in the long term. In the dunya, as well as in the akhirah. But if you do the opposite, you will lose in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he, wants, he wants this quality and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he ends this verse with, Inna Allah bima ta'maluna basir. He says, truly Allah is all seer of what you do. However you treat others, whatever rights you give them or you don't give them or you take away or you give extra or you're forgiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his basir. Nothing escapes his vision, nothing escapes his sight. He sees everything. And if you generous, if you forgive, you will be rewarded for, for sure. On the day of judgment, you will be rewarded. And if you don't, of course you can take your rights according to Sharia, that's fine. But if you oppress the other person, or if you don't have these qualities, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also sees this. 
He also sees this. So uh, with that, we end these three verses from 235 to 237. And this whole section is more or less finished in terms of this subject matter, um, especially around the issue of the rules and regulations surrounding the idda, the waiting period of different uh, cases or situations where the woman is divorced or widowed or is pregnant or has infant. So we, we discussed all those different uh, scenarios and situations over the past few weeks. And now uh, this section, this topic has ended in, the, in Surah Al-Baqarah. And there will be new topics starting from next week, inshallah, from verse 238 to do with Salah. Um, and just as a caveat as well, we've been discussing these issues for quite a few weeks. Um, one of the brothers came one, one week, I think he came halfway or he came to one of them. He just raised a, an issue, put it to my notice, which is good, is, is good to mention. These topics we mention as they come in the Qur'an, in the order they come. So uh, from around verse 200 and I think 22 or 25, up to now, those 10, 15 verses, mainly to do with divorce. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't mention the other verses of to do with marriage and to sacrifice and to keep the marriage and the virtues of marriage. He mentioned them in other places of the Quran. So um, some people hearing this may think the whole section is just talking about divorce. Secondly, it, it makes it sound very uh, a simple matter. Um, there's nothing wrong like, there's no sin if you do this, there's no blame if you do this. Don't misunderstand, this is the, uh, number one, this is the way the Qur'an has put together these verses to do with divorce. It's not the, divorce isn't the main thing, the main issue is the rights of women. This is what the verses are discussing. It's not encouraging divorce, it's making sure, it's talking about divorce as a matter of fact way. You know, as though these things happen. But then it's trying to protect, it, well it's not trying, it's, it's telling and commanding us to protect the rights of all parties, not the least the women in these situations, and also teaching us what is permissible, what is not permissible in the waiting period after the divorce or after the husband passes away. So the topic, you know, it's not that divorce and things like this is promoted or it's an easy thing. The Qur'an approaches things like this. The Qur'an doesn't approach divorce in a very negative way either, in terms of if it happens. But the Qur'an is simply telling us the rules and regulations surrounding it. Um, of course, in all cases, in any situation, um, the virtues of marriage are great, and everyone should try and protect their marriages and to keep the marriages intact for the benefit of the family, for the benefit of the community. That's not the issue here. The issue here is these rules, these verses were uh, discussing about the rules and surrounding um, different scenarios where the idda waiting period comes into play, whether it's of a widow or a divorcee. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to understand these rules, regulations and guidance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give us the tawfiq to implement the virtues, the virtuous qualities of taqwa, of forgiveness, of generosity in our own lives. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give our communities the understanding to properly um, interact with each other in these various scenarios. And just like to remind everyone, um, you know, the Prophet said in the meaning of a hadith that whenever people gather, to listen to the Qur'an or sit in a majlis to discuss the Qur'an where the Qur'anic guidance is being discussed or the halal haram of it, then, you know, the angels, they surround that place. They surround the place wherever there's a majlis of Qur'an. And, you know, whenever the angels surround a place, there is sakina, there's tranquility. So there's a lot of benefits to just coming to a dars of Qur'an. The angels will ask for, for your forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is proud to the angels of people who gather for knowledge, for especially Qur'an. Um, secondly, 
you will feel that tranquility. I feel it all the time, every week. Whenever I sit in this majlis, I feel it. It's something you can't describe because it's in the masjid, number one. It's not because of me, it's the Quran. It's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when an area or space is filled with angels who are, in, who are pure, in pure ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that has an impact on us, that has an impact in our hearts. And the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, have an impact. So you will feel that sakina, tranquility, right? Stop, take a break from, from our busy lives um, and all of the distractions that are out there and, and try and attend physically, that's best. Yes, it's available online as well. But, you know, at, at attending physically, being here, you'll feel the benefits, inshallah. So do um, invite others to come as well, inshallah.